right. Welcome, 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 Professor Peter Hawkins. Great to see you back. I think this is the fourth or fifth. We've lost track of times on the team coaching zone, but it's been a few years. Great to see you. It's been great partnering with you right from the early days through this journey. Yeah. From uh, uh, episode number 19, I still remember fondly back in 2015 and uh, probably, if not the most downloaded episode, one of them that we did together. But uh, it's been great knowing you all these years and uh, great to have you back on the show. Um, we had planned to have a couple of others joining us, but we've had some power outages for some and uh, other issues. So it looks like we will literally be the last men standing. <laughs> it was going to be women and men today, but uh, hopefully we can hold it down for the um, for the listeners and uh, those uh, joining in, whether live or, or afterwards. So great, Peter. So we find you uh, in your home today. Yep. I'm, I'm yep. looking out over... Uh, the rain's just stopped and I've got sort of 20 miles of countryside view out of my window and the sun is just breaking through. So that's a good sign. Lovely. Well, we have rain over here on this side of the pond. So uh, maybe that uh, you can send some of that over before the weekend arrives. But we still have a little bit of time here before the weekend sets in. And so, you know, Peter, we um, have fired up the team coaching zone again after some brief hiatus of being off and trying to move this a bit more into what we're calling these team coaching learning conversations. Because, you know, as I reflected back on the 140 or so episodes we've done on the team coaching zone, what really came to me was there's been a lot of great value and lots of ways out of it. But the biggest one for me really is really around the learning that has come, not just for me, but I still to this day get emails almost every week from team coaches around the world that have just valued having mm -hmm a space where people in the field, different philosophies, backgrounds, perspectives have an opportunity to share and learn together. And I know it's central in your thinking about team coaching around core learning, I know is a central part of your model, but uh, that's really the spirit of these. And also trying to move a little bit beyond the one-on-one -on -one interview, although today that, that is the dynamic. We've been getting more people in groups on the show to have uh, small group conversations. But anyways, that's the spirit of the show. Um, obviously, folks probably know a lot about you. I will pop up here uh, Peter's LinkedIn profile. But, you know, Peter, your um, profile has a long list of titles and accolades. But you want to give everybody kind of the short 15 uh, second elevator pitch on, uh, you know, how you d d define yourself these days or describe yourself in terms of your, your roles and the things you're involved in? Well, I, I think the most important, Krista, and you might have heard this from me before, as um, being a grandfather, a gardener, and an elder. <laughs> um, you know, and I think the other bit will be, what am I most passionate about? You see, and I was saying this before we started to you, I don't think the, wor the world needs more coaches or team coaches or facilitators or consultants. What I'm passionate about is how do I help enough people be able to do in-depth change, which connects the individual team, team of teams, mm. organizational transformation, stakeholder world, ecosystem world. Mm. And, 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 and to whichever level you're working with, how do you connect yeah. all those levels and hold all of those in mind? And, and I think that's, that's what, you know, I have so many people still contacting me from around the world, but yeah. I can't find enough people to pass the work on to. So, yeah. That's that, you know, I, I need those people because without that, it's going to be hard for me to retire, Krista. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll inspire a few people to uh, help join you in that um, that mission. But, you know, for those who are joining, Peter is prolific um, in the space. I don't know when you started actually using the term team coaching, Peter, but I guess it goes back 30 or 40 years. Do you do you remember mm -hmm. when you started to adopt that as a part of your lexicon? Um. I, I think, you know, I, I was thinking about this other day that I think the first team development I did was about 19, other than the teams I was leading myself as a leader, mm -hmm. um, when I was being hired in to help teams was about 1977, 78. Mm -hmm. uh, but in those days, yeah. we were talking about team development. Um, yeah, I remember right. the first program I ever did was... <clears throat> with MIT on task-orientated team development. And that was in mm. the late 70s. Was Edgar Schein uh, involved in that or? No, but I think then- just passed recently, we were just speaking about, yeah. But I was doing work with both the Tavistock and 
in those okay. days national training laboratories and i think right. those are still a lot of the roots of, of yeah that we we draw upon right um, but but the term team coaching uh, you know d team development work's been around for much longer than the term team coaching that's right um, I think it was probably around the end of the, the last millennium, the beginning of this, that, that I started to, to use that term. And so about 23 years, um, because I think before that, you know, people fell into either we're facilitators or we're team analysts or we're T group leaders or, you know, lots mm. of, and, and, and part of what I've been very involved in is how do we integrate the learning from all those different uh, what can be factions and how do we have an integrated approach which isn't just about what happens within the team so it's you i think you saw my blog on why we should no longer talk about high performing teams yeah um because what's much more important is not you know does the team just get on well and have good relationships and effective meetings and yeah. is efficient but is working with the team at all its stakeholder interfaces is it is it a high value creating team that mm. creates fantastic beneficial value for all its stakeholders mm. yeah yeah not just meet meet pre-existing goals exactly well i think that's really at the core of one of your big contributions to the field right in um it's really at the the center of your book on um, leadership team coaching, and um, I know I don't know remember what edition you're in now. Are you in the fifth edition or well, fourth edition of leadership fourth edition. team coaching and third okay. edition of um, leadership team coaching and practice, which is the uh, yeah the one with you know well case how did you develop book, yeah. this and um, what are all the case studies? Wonderful. Well, I think for those who are new to your work. Um, just Google uh, Peter Hawkins and his books will come up. I think leadership team coaching and the practice book are really kind of essential readings for anybody in the, in the space. Um, you know, I've been through uh, your programs a number of times and was an assistant faculty on the North America diploma program, which was amazing. Um, I know you've been partnering with the, uh, with the global team coaching Institute, you and professor Clutterbuck, but what are the kind of two or three big things uh, in the team coaching space you, you've been working on Peter? Well, um, you know, since you and I were, were working on the North American diploma, we brought out, um, along with, with colleagues, contributions from right around the world, this new book on ecological and climate conscious coaching, mm. a companion guide. And the nice thing about this book is it's written as a seven day workshop. So, you know, this is, this is, this is a training you can set up for yourselves, anyone can, whereby each chapter is a half day and it's mm. it's written with the, the the two facilitators welcoming you to the half day and what the what it's all about then inviting contributions from around the world and participants and there's i think we've got people from 40 different countries contributing to it and then there are exercises you can go off and do mm. um and i think that's relevant to team coaches because um the, the, the climate crisis is not something out there. The ecological crisis isn't something out there. Mm. It's a symptom of the real challenge, which is how we shift human consciousness. Mm. And I think yeah. we're at a stage in the, the world's evolution where we can no longer shift human consciousness one person at a time. Mm. Right? Well, or even one team at a time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, you know, I think the pandemic was a good example of um, a fundamental shift that has taken place that is irreversible. You know, I've been um, following kind of the geopolitical events and obviously the banking crisis that's been erupting over the last week. But there's a lot of concerns about the commercial real estate that people are never going to go back to and how that's going to cause a lot of trouble for banks who are holding um, those mortgages and owning those assets and the decline of those. And so it's interesting, you know, like the fundamental way we work now, working more from home. I know a lot of the clients I'm working with, they're still grappling with the right mix of in-person versus, you know, working from home forced a shift in better for worse, at least in the way we work, if not our, uh, some of our thinking 
Um, but sometimes, you know, we actually change mindsets as a result of being forced to change behaviors, right? Rather than yeah. the other way around. Yeah, and, but, and, yeah. and it, it, even with team coaching, um, we're really fundamentally looking at renewal associates, um, how we transform that. We, we have a project, Renewing Renewal, <laughs> which is a nice title. And, nice. and a part of that is we can no longer afford to have consultants and team coaches flying around the world, yeah. right? Even if we go back to face-to-face -face events. So how do we work globally with a company, but deliver locally? Yeah. And that requires, that requires an integrated approach with a global team of coaches. So, you know, we're currently mm. working with a large foundation with, with 30 teams right across Africa mm. where the work has to be delivered by black local African coaches. Um, and yep. You know, we can't go back to clients and say, well, there, there aren't enough of them yet. We have mm. need two years to train them. We have to train right. them wh while we're doing the work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have another project where we're delivering in um, probably 14 different countries. Mm. Um, and we're having to have an integrated approach, but approach where all, all the, the regional teams are being coached by regional people. Right, right. And And so that, along with... What, what you and I touched on previously, which is how do we realize that just, you know, just coaching one team at a time mm. is not enough. Yeah. How do we create the team of teams, which is more than the sum of its parts? Yeah. And, and that, um, you know, we're going to be doing another book on with, I'm doing with Professor Salome Van Koller from, University of Stellenbosch, where mm. you know, anyone would like to contribute to the research, we're just launching the research stage at the moment, where we're, we're trying to um, both send questionnaires to and then do structured interviews with organizations that are really trying to set out to creating a teaming culture. Yeah. Which is not only every team's being high value creating, but the team of teams mm. being high, more than some of their parts. And how the organization partners with their stakeholders being a teaming approach. Beautiful. Well, that may be a good um, segue, Peter, to get into the really the theme we were going to explore more. We've already started to touch on it, which is around the next challenge for team coaching, enabling organizational transformation. But just before we get into that, uh, Monica wanted to hear uh, what the name of that book was again, <laughs> uh, the one uh, that you were holding up. Uh, it's uh, Ecological and Climate Conscious Coaching. It's published by Routledge. And you'll see there's four of us who were the core editors, but uh, uh, David Drake, Zoe Kern were also involved. And there are many, you know, as I say, there's over 60 other contributors in the book. Yeah. Um, Alison Wybrow, whose name comes first, sadly um, died halfway through us putting the book together. Mm. which was a tragic loss um, and, and was quite a trauma for the, the whole team working on it. Mm. Lots of loss around, right? Uh, Edgar Schein, um, whose uh, original work on process consultation, which I think is one of the underpinnings of the team development field and a classic work, uh, passed away recently as well. Uh, did you know Edgar at all? Or Yes, I did a little. And, and I think the, the book I would, you know, process consultation was right at the beginning of the whole um, movement to how do we work in partnership rather than mm. see our as a supplier client but also I would really recommend his later book Humble Inquiry mm. how, how do we how do we right. bring that uh, how do we enable the work of team coaching to be a collaborative inquiry and walk mm. with the team to the learning edge yeah which I define as, you know, where the team doesn't have the answer, I don't have the answer, but we both recognize that the world is requiring us to find one. Right. For me, that's where all the great work happens, whether you're mm. a consultant, a coach, a team coach. It's at that learning edge. That's right. And, and at that learning edge, in my experience, the client always panics and says, so, yeah. so what should we do? 
<laughs> and, and at that moment, right. you have to hold on to your humility and not know better or know first or try and risk. But, but to say, you know, I don't know, but we need to work that out together. Let's figure it out together. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the, the coach would say, well, I'm sure you've got the answer. <laughs> and Salt will say, I'm sure I've got the answer. And they're both <laughs> wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love your little tech, you know, move there around an invitation to co-create, which is a word I think you've really popularized in the field as well, around the journey together. But for sure, and I think this, you know, for team coaches can appreciate this, that, you know, when getting into team coaching, there's a lot of performance anxiety. And the problem with the performance anxiety is it, it pushes us to want to have a plan and a structure and to control too much. And when we do that, we shut down really getting into a learning modality, right? And uh, we end up getting less performance. And so there is something powerful about how do we create a dynamic where there's a flow of learning that's happening? Because when that happens, people are creative, they're more resilient, they're more open and magic can happen. But um, if we can't get into that, yeah, then it's a, it's a little bit of a grind and a slog. So, so if I could just build on your last phrase. Yeah. Because I think the creativity that gets unleashed isn't just in, in the team members or in the team coach or even in the connection between them. I think what creativity at the learning edge is always kind of triangulated. Mm. It's co-created between the coach, the team, and most importantly, the life challenges that the generous challenges that life is providing that team. Mm. It's the external environment is, is, is one of the important co-creators. Absolutely. Um, I think you've heard me say before, Crystal, one of my favorite quotes is from Ram Das when he says, it's amazing how many of us have signed up at the school of life and then spend our lives complaining about the curriculum. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we don't get to choose the <laughs> curriculum. Right. Whether it's the banking crisis or COVID, we don't get to choose it. Right. We only get to choose how creative we are in response to it. Mm. Yeah. Well, and becoming fit, we're never fit for purpose when the challenge arrives. It's only through, you know, what's in the way is the way. It's actually navigating the challenge itself unle unlo unlocks the capability, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's pretty daunting when you look around at the geopolitical events in the world. Um, you know, one can just feel like it's hopeless. But on the other hand, you know, with great challenges, um, you know, tends to come an unlocking of great creativity and courage and adaptability. So uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll be, we're being tested. But um, what is it about this um, topic of the next challenge for team coaching, enabling organizational transformation that really is kind of capturing your attention, Peter? I think you already kind of seeded it a little bit with some of the comments around the dearth of people being able to work across multiple systems, having enough people around the world globally that can do this work. But I'm, I'm curious, why is this uh, something you're you're percolating on these days? Well, <clears throat> If we start from the majority of people coming into team coaching are coming in from the from the individual coaching end. Mm. Um, and there are some people who are coming in from the organizational consultancy end. But you know what we still need is people who can work in depth with the individual, can be in a room and and, and empathically tune into every single individual. But, but can not get caught by the individual interpersonal agendas, but, but see the team is probably also enacting, you know, they are a symptom of the organizational dynamic. Mm. And they're carrying one bit of the organizational system. And sometimes trying to help them better is that they want to just sub-optimize the bit of the system that they are carrying. Yeah. Mm. And that can actually, you know, I've seen team coaching lead to more dysfunctional organizations. Right. Because they're each trying to be the most successful team on the block and win for their stakeholders. So, you know, the sales right, right. department are trying to win for the customer and the 
HR for the employee and the finance department for the investor. Mm. Yeah. And all we've created is greater siloism. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things is I think it's really important that all team coaches not only understand the organizational culture and strategy and system, but understand what's going on at the multi-stakeholder interface. Mm -hmm. And that includes the ecological interface. Mm. You see, I think a lot of people can get nested systems in one direction. You know, I'm there's my system as an individual and I'm part of a team. And that team is part of a whole network of teams above it, beneath it, upstream, mm. downstream. That's part of an organizational culture and dynamic. That's part of a stakeholder system. That's part of the wider ecology and the planetary system. Mm. But what I think a lot of people struggle to really get in their, in, the, in their being is that all of those systems are nested within the systems beneath it. Mm. So, so I say there's no such thing as individual coaching because when the individual walks into the room, their team dynamic walks right. in yeah. within them. <laughs> That's the right. organizational culture, they can't tell you about the culture. The culture is part of their being. It's it has become part of their way of seeing and thinking. Mm. The ecology, you know, I, I was on a, a um, panel looking at coaching in nature, right, with real experts on this field. And mm. uh, I, I suddenly was in a quandary because I was the eldest and the only man on the panel. Now, how did I point out that we were, we, there, there was a kind of belief system in the room that coaching in nature equaled coaching out of doors? <laughs> you know, does that imply that everything that happens right. inside a building it's is not, un yeah, yeah. unnatural? <laughs> or people say, you know, ha right, right. it's not my job as a coach to bring the ecology into the room. Again, mm. you see, we're stuck with the notion right. that the ecology is something separate from us. Right, right. The climate crisis is out there. Mm. No, actually, it's inside you. You know, it's in the air you breathe. It's in the water you drink. It's in the way you think. Mm. They're all part of the climate crisis. The climate crisis is is inside you as much as it's outside you. That's right. That's right. And, and, and that means that whatever level uh, we're working at, whether it's an individual coach, a team coach, a team of teams, organizational transformation, stakeholder system, ecosystem, we have to be able to attend to all the other nested systems up and down. Yeah. Because they are all totally interconnected. That's right. And I think that's what you, uh, Adriana is asking here. What do you mean by ecological? I think it, it yeah, she meant to say interface. She may have heard interplace, but interface. But I think that's what you're actually describing right now. It, it is two way. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, um, the, e the ecological crisis is created is as Gregory Bateson was saying in the 1960s and seventies, one of my great teachers, great thinker of the 20th century who was saying look at root the ecological crisis which he was already talking about way back then is an epistemological crisis it's a symptom of how human beings think and act mm. right and so it's present in every individual coaching it's present in every team uh, meeting yeah. By what we're attending to and what we're not attending to. Yeah. Our unintended consequences of our, our, our of any decision we make and every action we make. Mm. Yeah. I think Peter, for the um, listeners, and I think Claire kind of teased this up well. She she asked how this complexity of nested systems can be managed so as to bring reflection and value to all parts involved. And I imagine um, you have cases. I know you're supervising a number of. Um, organizational transformation cases, team of teams. I, I wonder if a story or an anecdote or a case might help bring this from the realm of the abstract to help people really understand what this might look and feel like to demystify it a bit. Right. Well, ju just 
to, to directly respond to Claire, <clears throat> you know, so some of the techniques we've developed over the years, right, is um, most of, I'm working with a team next week um, in a well-known British media company, <laughs> um, where, you know, we will start by, uh, it's a team I haven't worked with before, we'll start by having, and you've, you've done this with me, Chris, on a number of occasions, five flip charts around the wall, and it will say, this team coaching will be a success for us as a team if, for, the, for all the employees who report to us and then part of the organization if, for our customers if, for our investors if, for future generations in the wider ecology if. Mm. And, and we collectively build that. And then we get members of the team to kind of sort all the post-its that are posted on the different boards and speak as mm. those stakeholders. What does, what does, what do the future generations? And I, you know, I, you've seen me dramatize it where I say, look, at great expense, we've flown people back from 2050 to tell us what they value about what we're doing today and what they need us to be doing differently. And I get members of the team to step into that shoes and, and yeah. bring that challenge in. Um, when I work with boards, as you know, I always bring in empty chairs, which say the investor, the customer, the employees, future generations, the ecology. And I get non-exec directors to get out of their chairs and step, go and sit in those chairs and comment on the strategic mm. debate that they've all been having from their from their into ego competitiveness, right? And it shifts the room. It always shifts the room. It's 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 really powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's and, and it I creates think a lot of motivation as well, right? And helps people get out of just an attachment to their siloed perspective yeah. and representing just their constituency. If it's a leadership team, right? And and yeah. and it's I think the two the two simplest powers we have as a team coach is to change the frame mm. either the time frame yeah so get them to not talk about what they want to achieve in the future but 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 talk future back you know question i use a lot you know what are you going to regret in three years time not having worked on in team coaching today mm. that's a, that's a, a simple time reframe or, or perspective reframe. So, you know, if if you were get step into the shoes of the stakeholder, step into if if you were an, a, an observer arriving from Mars visiting this team, <laughs> what what would you be impressed by? What would you be shocked by? Or if you were an independent observer, what what three words would you use to describe this team today? Mm. And what, what would you hope as team members they would be saying in th two years' time? You know, there's lots of ways we can... Right. We don't need to know better or know first, but, but we, can, we can shift the, 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 the level from first, level, uh, first person perspective, second person, right. third person, fourth person. Right. That's lovely. But to continue this on, Peter, I'm curious... Um, again, about some of the engagements you're overseeing or advising on where you're seeing, you know, I go back to, you know, years ago, people are familiar with uh, um, Lulu's book on reinventing organizations. And that, that book was really about looking at new models of organization design and organization practice. Many of them were self-organizing systems, very team centric type of organizational models. But you know, I know, again, the, the part of the theme for today's conversation is around enabling organizational transformation, right? Yeah. That's the, so I do think we, um, there is an organization design piece to this, but, um, you know, I think you've alluded to team of teams and kind of really different levels within an organizational system working in concert rather than just within the one team or a couple of teams that you're a part of that type of frame. So well, I'm curious if you have any stories that we could dig into. Yeah. About. So so let me talk about one that we're, we've been deeply engaged with. We're just coming to year three. So it started just over two years ago. I was running out, out of the blue. You know, would I come and coach this uh, 
global team they were trying to move from being an exco to an enterprise leadership team so, so that's very interesting mm -hmm. they tell me about that and what's that really mean and they said would you come in with and i said well maybe i never say yes i never say no <laughs> <laughs> i always say maybe <laughs> i say uh, they said well, what do you mean mother i said um well, first of all, I said, well, you know, why are you phoning me? And, the, and, and he said, well, I've been following your work for 25 years, but you, you haven't been aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, that's very interesting how it arrives. And I said, well, I need to go and speak to the chair and the CEO before I know whether I can work with you. Mm. And I've learned that the hard way that if, if, if I get brought in, he was the head of people and strategy. Yeah. And if I just have that as my anchor point, then I don't build a strong enough tent pegs mm. to survive whatever kind of right. storm <laughs> blows blows over our work, right? Mm. I need an anchor point beyond the one I'm working with. So I started working with, with a couple of colleagues with this team. And, and what we realized very soon that uh, for this team to really move from being focused on running the operations and being freed up to focus on the future and the strategy. They couldn't do that unless they could get their own teams beneath them to step up to do the business as usual work, mm. running the business, right, right, to free them up. So, you know, we would challenge them on how they were going to shift 25% mm. of their, their calendar out of their calendar, mm. step by step. Nice. And that's what they got us into being invited to get coaches to work with every team at the next level down mm -hmm. and then we realized that the, the relationship between the executive and the board was was not mm -hmm. as healthy as it could be so we got invited to work with the board and and actually it's not just work work the the the, the thing about team of teams work it's not oh now we're working with 12 teams actually it's how do we coach the spaces between them right yeah so in february this year we were we were doing a, a large we had their top 100 come together. This company has been going for 95 years. This mm. is the first time ever they've had a leadership forum. They've had lots of them, but this was the first one that had no platform, no podium, no presenters and no audience. <laughs> With your assistance, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> in the design. <laughs> they were so anxious, right? It had, it had 12 round tables. With a big bull ring, all facing mm. in into the center, with a big bull ring in the middle, right? Nice, nice. <laughs> um, uh, the anxiety level, uh, they said. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I coached the CEO through how he's going to introduce this. I mean, we did some pre work and uh, got all sorts of data from from everyone who was coming. Yeah, and and I got up and said, "Look, you know, I, I know some of you are really anxious that you don't have an agenda with, you know, what what's going to happen each session." Yeah, and so, so just to help you, here's your agenda. Day one, in order to uh, achieve our, our very exciting strategy and transformation, where do we need to be in 2027? Mm. Day two, what's the roadmap and what we're going to have to deal with in order to get there? Day three, making it happen in the room before we leave. Mm. I said, that's as much of an agenda as you're going to get, guys. <laughs> well, I'm sure that reduced the anxiety at least a percentage or two. <laughs> um, and every every session of the three days started with uh, two client videos with some of their major clients, and we'd set up the kind of interview. We didn't do the interviews, but we set them up and helped kind of mm. edit the edit the the the, the um, them down to being really impactful. What, what do we really value about you today? What's happening in the change of our world? And what are we going to really need different from you between now and 2027? Right? And what we find difficult about you. And so the, the client was the center of it, you know, all the time, this drumbeat of what's the world asking us to step up to? And you see, we couldn't have done that without not not everyone had been in team coaching sessions who was in that room because it wasn't yeah. done by hierarchy. Um, it was done by, you know, who are the people who can make the future happen. But the fact that we had pretty good relationships with 
some of the board, some of the mm. um, enterprise leadership team, some of the next level to, you know, we, we'd build a foundation where yeah. we could do that together. Yeah. You had enough ch champions in the room. And, and you know, that, that third day was most powerful because it was about one of the big things we did is we got people to work out what were the disconnections across the organization. Hmm. They wanted to be a global network seamless organization without a headquarters mm. located anywhere right with much better horizontal join up so they could deliver anywhere in the world but with a knowledge of the whole world they yeah. wanted to move from being a, a knowing organization to a learning organization they wanted to move from being a supplier to their their clients to being a partner right major major transformations mm. but it's how do we start not talking about it and planning it and coming up with an action plan, but doing it in the room. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, we had clients come to the dinners. We had, you know, mm. if, if, if we just come up with a great plan at the end of that, we know business as usual will swallow it up within a few weeks. Mm. We'll flood it out unless we get embodied change to happen on the event. Yeah. So I hope that, that they weren't ready for that, though, in year one or two, it sounds like there was a building up of readiness in the system. And yeah, yeah, but but well, actually, but be careful, because you could say, well, we're just trying to get them ready and then we're right, doing right. the work. But yeah, the work right. is happening at every stage, but it is yeah. a maturity journey. It is a it is. Um, um, and I wonder, you know, it might be a good challenge to say, well, how could we have got there in year one? That exactly. Might be a very, very good, good challenge, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you were describing the case, I mean, it, it was sort of like a, a picture of like of a spider web was start, was coming in my mind that you started with that first contact point and then these connections and nodes uh, like a, the network started to be brought online or in dialogue with each other. And then you're you're kind of expanding out to take on, you know, as much of the system as you can, right? Um, or here was representation with the hundred top leaders, right? Um, which I think is interesting around, at what point do you reach a tipping point where you have enough of the system um, engaged that actually that's when I think you start to see some shift in culture, right? Um, and obviously shifting to a learning culture and et cetera. I, I, I will often ask, when I work with the top team, because many of them have a very large transformational agenda as well as a business as usual agenda. Mm. And I, I, you know, like with this team, I asked, how many people do you have to have as transformational leaders as opposed to followers mm. for this transformation to really take right. root and flourish? And, you know, I might say, because you certainly ain't going to do it with the 12 people around this table. Mm. <laughs> not, not if you're a global organization. I think, you know, you, you remember the case I did around um, a, a government department that were having to cut their numbers of people from 138,000 to 95,000 and raise the quality of their work and deal with more people. Mm. And, you know, I asked them that question. And they said, so what's the right answer, Peter? I said, then no, come on, let's work it out together. Um, and then they they said, well, we need probably that that government department said we need 200. And I said, well, how are you going to in, how are you going to enroll 200 transformational leaders? Not people who just think, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea. We bought the vision, but are going to be out there as advocates and and role models and um, nodal points and change makers. Mm. They said, oh, well, you know, um, we'll bite them all in and we'll, we'll inspire them from the, from the stage. <laughs> and I said, where have you seen that work? Yeah. Because it, it doesn't, right? It, it's like, how do we build that community of endeavor? Not just vertically, but horizontally. And, mm -hmm. and that's where I think we need far more uh, team coaches to raise their game so that they can coach live the relationship between a team and the teams above it, beneath it, right. upstream, downstream, between 
teams and their stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's go over to that. But just before that, Peter, we got a couple of good questions that are coming up um, around the cases you've been sharing. So this first one, again, from Claire, she says she wonders coaching the space between them had to do with being conscious and transparent about what they need to do and be within their identities and roles, how deep you went into the system integration. Right. Um, you might have to help me understand the question. Um, yeah. The, you see, one of the things that I think I push the boundaries on, and I, I'm, we're, we're just with the, you mentioned the Global Team Coaching Institute, and we're just um, next month starting the first senior practitioner program. Mm. These are for people who are already trained team coaches and who've been out there doing team coaching. And this is very much how do we get them from being very competent team coaches to being people who can work yeah with with teaming right across an organization with the team of teams linking the teamwork to to the required organizational transformation as mm -hmm. well as linking it down into what's the personal transformation of the leader to transform the team what's the personal vertical development in me as team coach to create a shift of the relationship with the team for the team to create the shift of the relationship with the teams around them for the organization to create a team of teams and a shift between itself and its stakeholders for humanity to create a shift in how we partner with the ecology that's in us and around us you know that that's all in play so what what we train a lot of people and there are methodologies we use for bringing multiple teams into the room mm -hmm. there are methodologies we use for how do you not just talk to a team about its stakeholders but how do you coach live between the team and meeting with say some of its important customers mm. or a government top team meeting with the politicians and for me this is where the work becomes both frightening and exciting <laughs> right yeah uh, between an executive team and the board and and because I think, you know, I did this research when I was uh, working as professor at Henley, um, more full time than I am at the moment, on tomorrow's leadership and the necessary revolution in today's leadership development. And one of the quotes I'll never forget, it's a CEO who said, look, you know, I've got lots of coaches who coach my people, consultants who consult to parts of my organization. He might have added team coaches who coach teams within my business. You might have said that today, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he said, that's not where my challenges lie, right? He said, our challenges as an organization all lie in the connections, mm -hmm. not just between the people, but between the teams, between the functions, right, right, between right. us and our stakeholders. He said, where are the coaches that coach those connections? Yeah, yeah. And and that's that's what we're trying to work with with the senior practitioner program is, is how do you help people learn the skills right of not coaching parts or people but connections yeah i think for me developmentally you know as a coach a, a lot of my experience started obviously working with one team but a number of years back we were a colleague of mine were brought in to help with a workday transformation and there was a, a transformation from sap to workday for some of the core modules and so there were 11 teams working on that transformation a governance team a management team and nine developer teams and surprise surprise um you know six months before they were supposed to go live uh they really started to realize that they were more like a year and a half to two years out and the problem wasn't within the work within each of the teams but it was the lack of connection between the teams and anytime they had a dashboard thing around um, you know issues and so whenever the teams would report a red color issue by the time it got up to the governance team it somehow magically transformed to yellow and then to green so all the governance team was getting was that everything was on target but and so it wasn't until we actually brought you know all the teams in the room could we start to see you know the the spaces in between and how they were actually after two years into the work not even bought into the whole transformation to begin with just in terms of a shared collective purpose. So I think, um, you know, the example you just shared earlier is a big example of starting 
with a large system getting a hundred people in the room. But I think for team coaches, we can keep developmentally pushing ourselves beyond just one team to a yeah. couple of teams. You know, I think my first thing was to work with five or six teams and I got them in the room uh, with no podium and all that. And then moving up to 11 teams, I think the case example you shared probably involves hundreds of teams, I would imagine. Um, I, so I think it's about getting on that journey and, and just wherever you are, you can start to get on the learning edge to where if you're not feeling some fear and some terror, you're probably not um, playing at the level you need to, right? Yeah. And, and, and learning how to support yourself at, at those, the learning edge, because at that point, yeah. there is always a level of panic in the room. Yeah. But both, both of the client and in you. Right. But I love your normalizing that, right? I mean, just naming the anxiety in the room or naming those things kind of takes a little bit of the wind out of it. But, you know, I think some of that goes back to the um, group relations work and the T group work and understanding some of those forces. But Stefan's um, question here, I think, is similar to Claire's around once the new learning was embodied in the room and then people come and go over the time after the event, what did you learn how to best anchor the system's learnings over time? when people change? Um, well, two things, Stefan. Um, one is, I, I've always been a great believer that you learn more by teaching than you do by listening. <laughs> so um, we did we did rehearse uh, or get them to rehearse with each other. What was the the sharing they were going to do when they went back to their home teams, right? And and not just to um, talk about what it was, but but to to be it, to, to show how they were going to do it in an embodied way. Because we know that, you know, 80% of communication is nonverbal. So it was having some, <clears throat> you know, how do we start the ripple effects in the room but in a way that will make the ripple effects happen outside the room? And it's like um, there, there's now going to be a series of kind of following events in different regions, which are like many examples, but it's not just reporting back from one level to another. I, I try and ban reporting back. It's something all of you can do um, if you're ever involved in leadership events. Don't send people off into breakout rooms and then have breakouts report back. You know, I call it death by serial feedback. <laughs> What you have to do is you have to use the conversations in the small groups to start a bigger and better conversation in the large plenary. Yeah. And there are some skills to doing that. Yeah. Same way as when you come back from an event like that, just telling your team about it is, is not useful. Mm. It's like choosing what is some of the experiences from that you're now going to facilitate them through. Mm. And that's that's what we're always looking for in terms of the um, the the uh, increasing the ripples. Does that make sense? It does. I do think also, Peter. You know, in the team of teams work, there is uh, the idea of structures and um, ways of working, like scrums of Scrum, for example, where you have representation from various teams meeting and superordinate groups periodically and rotating membership around that. So. You don't have to have everybody in the in the um, room all the time, but it's helpful to have, you know, representation of the system showing up in various yeah. types of gatherings, right? But but I was thinking, linking back to what we were saying earlier, Krista, about what could we have got there quicker? I was thinking, of, yeah, uh, one of the cases that's in this um, this book, which was um, mm. on inter team coaching, team of teams coaching, where, where I was working with a hospital where where they were going through a restructure. So there we decided to get all the new teams in the room together. And we, 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 I had a lot of internal assistants and one, one of my colleagues assisting. And, and we actually had a big room and we had all the major team, senior teams in the room that were just starting. And, and they were all coached through developing their purpose, their vision, their team charter. And they're presenting to each other and getting feedback. But then the next bit, which was really important, was then to to live. Each team had to get up and say, in order to succeed with our purpose, vision, and charter, this is what we're going to need from you, the top team. This is what we're going to need from you, the support functions. This is what we're going to need from you, the other clinical division. 
this is what we need from you, Division 3, yeah? Mm. And so, and this was a live needs and offers. Mm. So if you like, there we are directly using some methodology to coach the connection from day one of the reorganization. Mm. Um, nice. Yeah, which was a fantastic launch. Yeah and, yeah, and by the way, with that one, we built in a KPI with the top team to reduce by eighty percent the number of issues that came up to the top team that could have been resolved horizontally at the, the level beneath them. Brilliant, and and that was tracked over the yeah. year. I love what you said about um, getting a transformation right at the beginning, because again, like my workday example, I was sharing because this work wasn't done at the beginning, it uh, ended up coming back to bite them in the tail and slowing them, you know, double the length of time it should have taken to do the implementation um, by not building that, that those set of relationships and really getting the alignment of the system and co-creating the transformation. Um, so what, Peter, yeah. mm -hmm. what, what, what could you have done differently, Krista, that would have at least you know, either at the beginning or halfway through um, raised the, um, the, the warning and got them to have the right sleepless night? <laughs> well, we weren't even we weren't brought in until, um, you know, they put a brakes on the whole thing. They, you know, they brought in one of the big four. So they hired, they fired, you know, a couple of high profile firings of certain people, uh, their clients and their own internal, you know, leaders to, you know, somebody had to be uh, the fall guy uh, for the, uh, the problem. But they've really brought us in to kind of do a relaunch in a way. And so each of the nine developer teams were co-led by two leaders, a, an IT leader and a functional leader. And we had all those folks in the room, plus representation of man the management team and the governance team. And we started there and it, what really emerged was um, our whole plan for the day, we threw out the window within the first 45 minutes because what we really discovered was um, they didn't really have a shared sense of purpose and um, you know, uh, a belief that they actually could pull off the work itself. And so we ended up starting there and that was a profound you know, conversation for them. But I, if I, you know, had um, been involved in that engagement, I think the big lesson is the the sooner we can get in, the way teams launch or teams of teams launch is a huge opportunity because they get on a trajectory. And at some point, maybe it's the midpoint or at different uh, strategic points, they become more open to intervention. But you miss a golden opportunity if you don't really uh, launch well. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I launch that's well. My learning. Yeah, is to is to launch in connection rather than in parts. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so all of the teams were focused on just getting their own team up and running with their role or their part of the transformation, but that didn't. That wasn't where the it fell apart. It wasn't in the parts, right? It was in the yeah. as you're saying. And and, and it, with any reorganization, we know. We then concentrate on the boxes rather than the the, the solid lines right. and the dotted lines and the horizontal and the vertical. Yeah. And and you know one of the things I I learned a lot from Barry Oshry to name another kind yeah. of important figure in the field uh, who wrote Seeing Systems and Leading Systems is that that you know when people say to me do you change culture top down or bottom up these days I say neither. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, if you really want to get culture change happening, it's it's not just top down, bottom, bottom up, top down. It's also horizontal across. Mm. Mm. The people who've got investment in the culture of the future are the, are, are the next That's generation right. who are going to be taking over. Right. How do you get them to be in the middle, the integrators and the culture changers of the organization? Yeah. And yeah. most of them spend all their time, as Barry talks about. Right running up and down the chimneys between the people at the top and the people at the bottom mm. rather than joining up across. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So Peter, I see we just have about five minutes left here and I want to be respectful of your, our, your time today and the listener's time, but um, maybe we could pivot a little bit. There's a couple more questions that have been queued up and Claire again, back with a good one here. And this is a little bit, I think you've already started to elude this, but how can we help the team coaches out there really start to level up 
um, to be doing this kind of work, which, you know, she describes in such a complex and exciting way. And what are the steps to get there? So uh, I think you've already alluded, you have a program for more advanced practitioners, but yeah. Well, let me just say a bit about that because, um, you know, within the Global Team Coaching Institute, we, we, we had the programs at Gateway, which was about team literacy. And yeah, that's the starting place. And, and that's partly because I, I strongly believe that every coach, every team leader, every HRBP needs to have team literacy. Why? Because one of the most popular issues that executives bring to coaching is how do I deal with my team dynamic? How do I deal with mm -hmm. conflict? How do I develop my team? So every every individual coach sooner or later is supervising team coaching. So that's that's level one. Le level two is you know people who are who are learning how do I shift to coaching a whole team either from a being an HR person, a consultant, a coach, and that has its whole skill sets. And that's where, you know, people need to, to, you know, we teach about the five disciplines. We teach about how do you, how do you coach a team live in its business as usual meetings, not just facilitate offsite workshops. The third level, which is what we do on the senior practitioner is very much once you've done that, how do you move beyond coaching the team within their box? <laughs> And how do you coach across the boundaries? Yeah, how do you coach multiple teams in the same system and make them more than some of their parts? How do you coach up the system and across the system? And um, and I think you know just getting stuck at one of those levels is is a problem because yeah you know if if you're an independent coach, you can spend a lot of time winning the next team coaching contract, right? Whereas you create far more value if you could be with an organization like the one I mentioned earlier or the ones yeah. we work with. Normally I'm with them for three years and then we're doing working with multiple teams and the and the spaces between them. Yeah. Right? Um, I always say it's for any individual, you can't you can't work with, with more than three of those at any one time and you better make sure one's in year one, one's in year two and one's in year three. If they're all in year one, <laughs> you've got a lot of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that's where we need people to get to is, yeah. you know, they can work with the whole organization and its relationship to the UN sustainability goals and mm. how do we co-create value with our investors, customers, partner organizations, change our whole relationship with our employees, many of whom may now be contractors. Yeah. You know? Well, it's a little um, bit of a catch-22, Peter, because I think, you know, we've had a pouring of people pouring into the field, right, of team coaching, which... In some ways, then you have kind of a broader base of folks who are probably still early on in the journey. But I think the good news is we have a lot of people in the level one, two um, place. And now it's about yeah. folks seeing a, the path, which I think you've out, outlined here a bit of what the next step is and what that can look like. So, And, and you and can't me... race through these levels, right? You kind of got to earn your way through them. I think yeah. I've been doing team, you know, really focusing on team coaching for eight years. And I think I'm still on my developmental journey going, you know, hopefully taking some bigger risks here and there and moving along, but you can't get to the level five in one year, right? It's uh, you got to get it in your bones. And, and, and part of that is I've talked about the external curriculum and we have, Krista, there's also the internal curriculum. That's right. It, you know, if, for those of you who know vertical development, you know, many people come on the gateway from the expert technician. You know what? What's the methodology? What are the tools? What are the steps? Yeah. yeah. Then they get to the achiever level that Bill Torbert would talk about, and it would be you know. So, what, what's the outcome that we have to partner to produce? Hmm. Yeah. But but most of the people who come on our higher level courses, they they start it post achiever it, it redefining. They can see the pattern. They can see the process. They can see the need, but their interventions tend to be. Uh, reflections or questions or commentary, and what we what we have to do with it, with the, with this final uh, program that we do or the diploma you you worked with us on this, it, it, you saw us try to work with people from redefining what Bill Talbot calls redefining to transforming, to make interventions that don't just give insight, mm. but shift what's happening 
dynamically in the moment. Hmm. And, and that just requires so much uh, psychological, yeah. spiritual, personal work. Right. Um, because you're working from not expertise, you're not working from skill or competence, yeah. you're, you're working from source. It's being... It's the being, and, yeah. and and you you are able to voice be the voice of necessity, not mm. the voice of expertise. Beautiful. And that's 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 why, mm. yeah. As you say, it, it takes years. You know, I hopefully I can I can help before I retire enough people to get there quicker than it took me, Krista. I don't think you're ever going to retire, Peter, because the demand <laughs> is going to continue to uh, accelerate on a steep curve. Uh, so we're going to but, keep you but, engaged. But if I could, you know, as I said to you once upon a time, if I could get, you know, 30, 40 people who want to work with me over time, um, you know, I've got lots of good people who can train the lower levels mm -hmm. now. Got a great faculty right around the world. But but I just want to work with, you know, 30 or 40 who are really dedicated to, yeah, we want to work across all those levels in an integrated way yeah, at depth in a way that the world is calling out for. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, I think a great place, Peter, to uh, start to bring this episode down. Um, there's never enough time, but hopefully we, um, you know, whet some appetite here and people walk away with a few nuggets of inspiration and practical ideas. Obviously you have all the books that you've uh, mentioned today. So folks can um, go, I, where's the best place for people to go? Is it Amazon? Is it your website? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Go to Amazon. And then if you really like it, do put a review on for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but Krista, let me just say it's, it, it's always great. The conversations with you are always great and generative. So, um, Thank you for inviting me back. Oh, it's always, it's always a, pleasure. a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Great to be in your presence, Peter. Everybody, thank you for joining today. This episode will be available still on LinkedIn and YouTube, and uh, we'll be putting it out on the uh, podcast channels. So uh, hope you enjoy this episode, another great episode with uh, Professor Peter Hawkins. Have a great finish to your week and weekend, and we'll see you uh, next time on the Team Coaching Zone podcast. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining. Yep.